Sure, sure. Okay, uh, just a second. So uh, I think, yeah, right now we are recording. So uh, we are having Professor uh, Dr. Z uh, Zoltan Ziporas. He is uh, a researcher uh, in quantum computing uh, in Wigner Research Center for Physics. So um, without further ado, uh, I give the, the mic to, uh, to, to Professor Zoltan. So please, uh, I'm as, as usual. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, for this, so indeed, as uh, Karim said, so I actually cannot see either the time or the participants. So uh, please forgive me that. So I'm just trying to look at the camera. So uh, yes, as Karim said, I'm, uh, I'm actually a research associate professor at the Wiener Research Center for Physics. Uh, this uh, is in the network of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and it's the biggest uh, physics institute in uh, Budapest and in Hungary. And uh, I'm also, and I, uh, there I'm the head of the quantum computing and information group. And I'm also uh, adjunct uh, associate professor at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics at the Mathematical Institute. And um, <clears throat> I mostly work on quantum computing in the NISC era. So, like what kind of algorithms can you use already with existing quantum computers? And one of these are actually this, um, it's called QAOA. So what is a QAOA I'm going to talk about? It's uh, the original, uh, it, 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 it came from a wordplay about quantum approximate optimization algorithm, but right now it has been extended and now QAOA sometimes also means quantum alternating operator ansatz. The fathers of uh, QAOA um, were, um, were um, Gutmann and Farhi and Goldstone, the same people who also uh, came up with the idea of adiabatic quantum computation. And my talk is somehow well placed in the sense that uh, we had this great talk about uh, machine learning and I'm uh, going to refer to that in a little bit because it's also like a variational quantum algorithm like QAOA. So in that respect, uh, it's, it's very similar. And on the other hand, the next talk will be about uh, quantum adiabatic algorithms. And I will start actually with that because uh, although QAOA is a sort of, sort of gate-based uh, quantum algorithm, it is, um, it has its roots in, in uh, the adiabatic quantum computation or quantum annealing. And that's the inspiration for QAOA. So this starts from a, with a theorem from physics, actually, quantum physics, the so-called adiabatic theorem. Um, I'm only going to say the folk version, like the layman's version of this first, but then I can also give you some more precise states in, in one second. So it's about the following thing. Suppose you have a Hamiltonian, so a self-adjoint uh, uh, self -adjoint operator, emission operator, and you look at its eigenstate, which is in physics called the ground state of that. And of course, uh, if you solve the Schrodinger equation, what happens is that this state is not going to be evolve, it only gets some phase factor during the time. However, if you start to change the Hamiltonian, meaning that you change the physical system a little bit, for example, tune up some magnetic field or, or do some any other perturbations to the system, you can, you can model that, that your Hamiltonian changes in time. Basically, what, what uh, is happening is that uh, that in that case, if your Hamiltonian starts to change, of course, the ground state, which was an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so it wouldn't uh, evolve, really, now it starts to evolve as uh, the Hamiltonian starts to evolve. Like, like it's not anymore an uh, uh, eigenstate of the new Hamiltonians. And it turns out that if you, uh, if the change of the Hamiltonian of this operator in time is very slow, then basically your ground state will evolve in such a way that it 
remains a ground state of the new Hamiltonian that how you like like the instantaneous uh, Hamiltonian each time almost the same state what does it mean uh, precisely well we have to go to a, a precise version of the adiabatic theorem for that mm, I'm not gonna go into this very deeply just uh, show what what is the most important thing so we suppose that uh, we start from a, a, a state uh, psi zero and then small t will denote time big t uh, is, a, is a parameter where, when we want to end the evolution and uh, now we, we scale the Hamiltonian now it's not like anymore uh, well it's time dependent but we, we introduce a new variable small t divided by big t and um, and uh, if we take uh, the derivatives with respect to this uh, variable, we can see that if and, and if we calculate the gap delta, the gap delta is basically uh, usually if you have a Hamiltonian, the gap is the difference between the smallest eigenvalue of the Hermitian operator. It's a, always a real number and the next smallest eigenvalue. And uh, it turns out that if uh, t is large enough, which large means this quantity, like it's 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 larger than one over epsilon. I will tell you what this epsilon is. It's a small parameter, so this is a big uh, parameter. And multiplied by this value here, you see the derivatives of the Hamiltonian, and also the, the gap appears. The bigger the gap, the better the uh, the, the less you need to scale up t, so delta means uh, is of course here the smallest gap during the full evolution of this Hermitian operator, the Hamiltonian. Then basically the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation at time t equal big t, so in the variable small t divided by big t, it's one, this psi one, it will be Epsilon close in norm two, so in the the more in the usual uh, Euclidean norm in the Hilbert space or the Hilbert space norm, it will be very close to the phi, which is the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian H one. So this is the adiabatic theorem. It says that basically, if you if your system is evolved slowly enough, then uh, uh, you stay and uh, you, you will remain the ground state of the instantaneous Hamiltonian operator at each each time t. So of course this is a very very strong uh, uh, statement because many of the problems in uh, optimization theory can be recast actually as a so-called cubo problem. This is the quadratic on unconstrained binary optimization problem, uh, which in turn can be recast into uh, the so-called um, Ising model, uh, which is nothing else than you introduce uh, spin variables. So you, you think of a lattice of uh, lattice, and then each lattice point, you can imagine that you have a spin it's a variable uh, that can take plus and minus one values and uh, and then you you uh, you introduce a cost function or an objective function i mean it depends what you we want i mean cost function you we usually want to minimize an objective function you want to maximize but it's only a sign difference between them and 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 in, in and if you take a quadratic function so it's quadratic and linear in the function of spins, uh, then this is something which is equivalent. This is called an Ising model, classical Ising model, and it's equivalent to a, to a, so a, to, to this cubo problems, which uh, are, are simply the same just with binary variables, with variables taking zeros and ones, not one and minus one. The one and minus one is more interesting for us, that version, they are equivalent, but just you have to translate them because this you can immediately invent as a quantum Hamiltonian. Namely, 
if you think about the Pauli Z operator uh, at site I, we will denote it as ZI. So this is the operator that acts on each side, like we think now a lattice of qubits, and on the ith qubit it acts as Pauli Z. So in the computational basis, Pauli Z means that uh, that uh, zero is mapped to zero and one is mapped to minus one, and all other qubits are left invariant. Now, if you multiply two such operators, ZI, ZJ, and you take also single uh, qubit term ZI, and you look at the Hamiltonian of this form, which I'm showing here, um, then this is exactly uh, the ground state of that. The ground state energy is exactly the same as the ground state energy of the like the lowest energy, meaning the lowest eigenvalue of the Ising model problem. And um, and then <clears throat> and and then one can imagine that now we can solve. Uh, can solve maybe physics problems. How can we solve physics problems uh, using or, or, or optimization problems through physics using optimization? Well, this is the idea of quantum annealing. Namely, you start from the, the state plus, 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 plus. So each qubit is in, in the state plus. What is that state? And that's nothing than the equal weighted linear combination of the state zero and one. So it's square root of two times zero plus the square root of two. One over, oh, sorry, one over the square root of two plus zero plus one over the square root of two plus one. And if you tensor these all together, actually what you get is the equal weighted superposition of all the binary strings in the computational basis. So if you if you write this one out in the computational basis, that is in the basis of of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. Actually, you get all of them with the same weight, like a, it's an equal superposition of, of all the outcomes, like zeros and one outcomes. So it's a good state, and it's actually nothing but the ground state, so the smallest uh, eigenvalue, eigen state of the Hamiltonian, which is uh, sum over i xi. What is xi? In the si similar way as we introduced zi, xi is the Pauli operator x that acts on the ith qubit and it acts as identity on the rest of the qubit. So it reduces invariant. How does x act on a single qubit? x simply acts in the following way that it maps the zero state to the state one and, and one to the state zero. And if you look at the sum of these and with a minus sign, then it turns out that actually this is the lowest eigenstate. So if you start with such a Hamiltonian and you prepare this eigenstate, which is easily preparable, it's very easy. You just have to start on the zero, zero, zero state and apply, let's say, Hadamard, and then start to decrease the strength, the coupling strength of this Hamiltonian is GS. So it starts at time equal one with one, like with the strong, and, and here the objective Hamiltonian, which we, the, the ground state that we want to reach of this one, or the highest energy state, we, we start with zero, so it's, this is not turned on, and then we slowly tune down GS with time, such that in small t equal big T, so then if in the variable uh, small t divided by capital T, you you get zero here, so this term is not there anymore, and you get one here. Then if the adiabatic theorem would have been satisfied enough up to epsilon, then actually you would reach the ground state of this Hamiltonian and you would know what the ground state is. Uh, that's excellent, because that means you could solve all these problems. Of course there is a catch, because it turns out that uh, this is an NP-complete problem, and nobody expects that we can solve NP-complete uh, problems with uh, quantum computers. We expect that we can solve maybe problems uh, in polynomial time, at least, in, in polynomial uh, problems outside of P with a quantum po a computer uh, in polynomial time, let's say the short algorithm, but, not, but that's not an NP-complete NP problem. So actually, the catch is that, of course, if you go back, if we go back and look at this time, you have this gap here. And unfortunately, that gap, uh, when you look at bigger and bigger systems, which are 
pretty generic, then it, it usually becomes very, very sm uh, small, exponentially small. So to get the solution, you would need exponentially long time. So of course, sometimes there are some problems that you cannot solve in polynomial time like that, but some problems you can. So this is called quantum annealing, and the next uh, talk is going to be about this. So how does the QAOA, which is a gate-based uh, method, uh, come to play here? Well, to the Suzuki Trotter expansion, I'm not going to talk about all of these, although all, all three of these are very interesting. Only, let's say, the first two lines I'm going to talk about. And the meaning of the first two lines is that basically what you can do if you have a, if you time evolve, like time evolution goes in the following way, if you have a Hamiltonian, which is time independent, then you, you, you can, uh, you know that the time evolution of that is a unitary operator, which can be calculated as the exponent, exponent of minus i times t times h, where h is the Hamiltonian. That's the unitary. Uh, but then there is this mathematical theorem that says that if you would take e to the a and e to the b, but with a, in a very small, with a very small, small step, one over n, one over n, and do it n times, it's almost the same as taking e to the a plus b. Like the second line says how close you are. It depends on n, of course, and the commutator. I mean, if a and b would commute, they would obviously believe already the same exactly. And using the Suzuki Trotter expansion, it turns out that uh, a so called Trotterization can be applied on the continuous uh, time evolution. Trotterization means that you have let a Hamiltonian where you have a unitary, which is an exponent of, uh, uh, so exponential of some complicated Hamiltonian, and you make the terms, uh, you somehow use this Suzuki Trotter expansion and uh, and only take first the time evolution of one term, then the time evolution of the other term, then again the first term, and so on. And if you use that, what you can do is that actually, uh, you have, we had this xi term, do you remember? That was basically the Hamiltonian, which uh, was um, <coughs> relating uh, to the uh, to the ground state, uh, the original ground state problem, the plus, plus, plus. You take this Hamiltonian, this minus uh, xi, and then also take the objective Hamiltonian, and with small steps, which I now de denote by theta i and theta i prime, you first evolve with, uh, let's say, this x Hamiltonian, then you evolve with the objective Hamiltonian again, then with the x, then with the objective, then with the x, object with small theta so for a small amount of time and it it actually would mean that you can using that um, basically follow the 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 adiabatic evolution so also with the gate based model you could just uh, follow the adiabatic evolution and get the same results so that's like uh, some of the idea of the QAOA but then they say that okay but now we are not bound by this, uh, by by the adiabatic theorem. Why not make a hybrid classical quantum algorithm where these thetas are, are not coming from a totalization of a, of an adiabatic time evolution, but they are coming from an optimal, like we just optimize over them in the same way as you could hear in the second talk how one would optimize over a parametric. Uh, variation or quantum uh, machine learning model. In the same way, this would also be a variational uh, um, variational quantum circuit where we would just take these theta i's and vary, uh, and vary over them as, as we want. So these thetas will be optimized. Okay, and how would we optimize? Well, I'm not going to talk about this uh, deeply. But uh, basically, you can have some gradient descent algorithm or, or any other type of algorithm. In the second talk, we talk about this. So how do we imagine it once again? What we do is, once again, is that we start from the plus, 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 plus state, then apply for a short time gamma i the 
the cost or objective Hamiltonian, then we apply the X Hamiltonian, which is nothing else but like single, like the single extra tensions, if you think of it, because if you would exponentiate uh, uh, this, that, that, that would mean that you would, uh, uh, you, you, these are single extra tensions simply. Okay, and uh, we will go deep, more deeply into this. Mm. Uh, Karim, may I ask you how much time do I have left? Actually, you you still have twenty five minutes. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's it's really perfectly enough. So I'm not going to go very very deeply uh, to uh, uh, particular problems, but one particular problem that's always used uh, for in quantum engineering problems. If you go to the to uh, the most famous quantum annealing uh, hardware's uh, homepage, the D-Wave company's homepage, where they have this quantum annealing hardware, you find this problem all the time. It's a so-called uh, traveling salesperson problem, meaning that you have some complicated graph and you want to make a so-called, um, you go want to make uh, like a weighted graph and you want to find a Hamiltonian uh, path, uh, which means a Hamiltonian path is, is a path that, that in the graph you go along each edge only, uh, like not each edge, but in, in, in each edge you pass once or zero times, and, and you visit all the cities and then or all the vertices in graph language, and then uh, you go back to the original uh, point. And then you, in a weighted graph you ask that the generic Hamiltonian uh, path would be, would be this, and you could ask whether a graph has that or not, but in the case of traveling uh, salesperson problem, you have a weighted graph and you ask for the one, th that Hamiltonian circle, it's also called, uh, which is has the smallest weight if you add them. And actually, you can write this easily as a so-called higher order binary optimization problem, uh, I'm not going to do it. It it, it basically uh, you can introduce uh, uh, some uh, for for uh, yeah for each uh, uh, city. Well, yes. I mean you can you can in in a canonical way write that. It's harder to write a quadratic uh, unconstrained binary optimization problem. So like an Isaac model, which I we were talking about in the beginning, but it's still possible. But you need more uh, number of, uh, of of spins or bits. You need n square if you have n cities. And uh, uh, and and this is exactly how you do when you talk about quantum annealing. What you do is that you turn into that problem into a two local uh, Ising model, uh, like this one, this J I J S I S J S I with with some additional. Uh, uh, you have to add these additional spins, and and then what happens is that um, is that you want to optimize uh, over this. Uh, you want to find a configuration which gives the smallest value for this uh, <clears throat> cost function, and this you embed as a quantumizing Hamiltonian with Z i Z j operators, and uh, yeah, sorry, and and then then you uh, uh, run the quantum annealing algorithm. Actually, it's even more complicated because if you go to the current uh, hardware, what you will find is that you don't have like a complete graph. You cannot couple any SI with any SJ. You have like some kind of graph, which could be uh, previously it was the Chimera graph on, on D-Wave 2000. Now you have D-Wave Advantage. There you have the so-called Pegasus graph. And, and then you have to actually even add new spins to but there is a technique how to, like uh, I'm just showing it that you can look at like how to embed, uh, for example, a coloring problem here, which you have here, to 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 such a different graph. Like if you would have a, compl a complete graph, then you would not have to care about this additional step. Uh, so, so in conclusion, this is the problem with with annealing hardware. Or there are many problems actually. Uh, they're even more severe, but right now this is also a problem that you, you only have these two local interaction 
which follows a special topology. And uh, this means that actually, if, if, you're, if you have a problem, which in principle would require n variables, usually you have to embed it into a much, uh, much more uh, number of uh, qubits. Let's say in the, in the traveling assessment problem, you have to embed it into n squared qubits. And um, uh, and and um, oh, sorry, my uh, there is some. Then I can. I want to talk. I'm sorry. Just my uh, daughter came in. Uh, do you, do you still hear me? I'm really sorry for this. Yeah, sure, it's okay, no it's okay. Sorry for this. Where is my... Uh, uh, ah, here. Sorry for this uh, escape. One second. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, so this, uh, yeah, so so what would happen is, you, you see my screen, right? Now, again. Yes, we, oh, we can see yeah. it, yes. Okay, okay, we can okay. See. okay. so th this is the pr problem with the, uh, with this quantum engineering hardware, that we have these two local interactions only with a special topology and, and, uh, and, and you need many qubits. So what happens in the case of QAOA? Well, actually, you start with the same type of uh, classical Hobo problem, maybe, and this you move to a spin model, uh, and in principle, there are no extra uh, qubits needed because you will have interactions of the form. So each spin as i, this classical variable which could take plus one or minus one, that would uh, be now transformed to this Pauli operator. Zi that only acts on the ith qubit, and the the and you have like a multiplication of those Pauli operators, and then if you would uh, if you would uh, uh, you actually can implement this uh, as I will show. So first of all, there is this mixer Hamiltonian with the xi's, the sum over xi, and as I mentioned, this will only be like a local operator, if because uh, you can they they commute these xi's with each other, so using this Suzuki Trotter expansion formula, you can see that actually this is nothing else than a rotation with Xi on each qubit. So you have a product over that. And as for the objective uh, Hamiltonian, uh, first of all, you also notice that they are commuting with each other all the terms because they are ZZ terms. And uh, a term uh, of this form, e to the minus i theta, times alpha z1, z2, with, can be actually, you can man manage to make it as a two qubit term, and with the z1, z2, z3 as a three qubit term, uh, in the following way. So if you have, uh, let's say, uh, four z's, then you will have like, uh, you, you have to, like, like for z, z term, you only need a, a C naught uh, rotation with the angle, around z and the c naught. That's like a e to the minus i alpha z to z3. That would be only these uh, three gates, two, two qubit gates and one two qubit. If you would have a z, z like e to the minus i alpha z1, z2, z3, then you would need four c naughts, these two c naughts, these two c naughts, and a rotation here. If you would have e to the minus i alpha Z0, Z1, Z2, Z3, then you would need six C0 and the rotation. Okay, and similarly, if you would have like a 
five Z terms, we would have this one. So, so all of these terms can be implemented rather easily. Um, of course, these C knots uh, don't uh, commute with each other and also with, with uh, the Z operator, but still, uh, you don't, we need not need uh, any extra uh, qubit, and uh, and you can actually have many cancellations. I'm going to show it here. So if you would have had a term of, of uh, a fifth order term and a third order term and a fourth order term, you actually will have this type of thing. So you can actually use some cancellations even. This this happens, and. Um, so now we can make the circuit, like decompose uh, the QAOA circuit like that. But of course, there are these three parameters, and we have to run uh, the optimizer. So, for example, we can do uh, we can we can uh, do like some gradient descent algorithm, like first of uh, and then it fix the parameters and. Uh, like some some angles, and then measure, measure many times, and if you measure many times, you can estimate the energy of the, or, or, or the cost, like for, for that state, the value of the cost Hamiltonian that we measure, so basically the, the energy, average energy of the state that we have in those parameters. Then we can estimate the gradient by moving a little bit the angles, or we can estimate also the full Hessian, but, but even a simple gradient, one-dimensional gradient, can be also good. And uh, and then, according to how what the gradient shows, you can optimize the parameters, or with some other uh, classical optimization method. And uh, and this is actually very useful in the in the NISC era. What is the NISC era? This is the so-called near uh, intermediate scale quantum. Uh, sorry, noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, device era. This is uh, John Preskill uh, coined this term. And, uh, and why is this uh, an important term? Because actually it shows that current quantum computers are noisy. It's not like that we, we can use those algorithms directly that we have in Nielsen and Chuang. Uh, so, so we can only implement the unitary gates up to some precision, the measurements are noisy, and uh, and also we don't have many qubits. But all of these are are, are sort of uh, good for uh, QAOA because it's it's noise resistant. Uh, the measurement noise can actually the measurements are only classical measurements, and there are very good uh, error mitigation schemes. I'm also working on on those. Uh, Without error mitigation schemes, uh, that that can compensate for the for the noise in the measurements, and actually, as as I showed, uh, the QAOA can, can need much less qubits than for a annealing device. Okay, so if you, for example, at home want to run a QAOA, uh, what can you do? Uh, like simulate it, of course, not like on a quantum computer, but simulate it with Qiskit or something, or or Penulate. Of course, usually what they have is that you can calculate immediately the the excitation value of a Hamiltonian in the given state. But it's not close to experiment because this is fast. But in experiments, you have like measurements, and you have to then estimate the energy uh, from that. Actually, when we write paper, we always come to that point, and uh, it's it's. Uh, it, it makes measurements and uh, like this is important. And if you want to make it really close to real life, and 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 uh, you want to you have an algorithm and you want to first test it in a classical computer and then run it on a quantum software, you also have to take into account the different type of noise, and uh, and then how uh, you scale your algorithm or, or or look how your algorithm would scale. Of course, such simulations are very good, but they are also very slow. I can tell you. Uh, and when we run such an algorithm, the quality measures that we have is the number of qubits. It, it should be not too many, and this is very good for QAOAs. The depth of the circuit should not be too long, and also the number of uh, Pauli terms in the in the 
in those Hamiltonians and then we estimate uh, and all, all in the Hamiltonians when we estimate the energy should be also know the lower the better. It should be noise robust, what QAOA is, it's very important. And and you have to also look how many runs of measurements you have to do, so to estimate the energy well. Actually, there are some very interesting schemes that we are working together with Karim also, called the stochastic gradient or quantum stochastic gradient descent schemes, but actually you make much fewer measurements than would be needed for the exact estimation of the of the of the cost Hamiltonian value in that state. Uh, but still the algorithm works actually. That's a very interesting thing. And and all of I, because of these uh, quality measures actually mostly QAOA works very well. And I'm just gonna advertise one paper that we did together. This was a great collaboration with Wigner. I mean, uh, uh, me and Karim were from Wigner, you see here us. There was also Joel Tabi, who is my PhD student, and to, supervised together by the vice dean of the Estrella University, uh, Tomasz Kozik, and uh, and also some Ericsson people were involved because they are very interested in this graph colony problem as it, it's an important problem in, in uh, telecommunication and also from the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, Adam Gloss were involved in this project. And, uh, and and we got into this conference and we also made a paper on this, this, this IEEE International Conference on Quantum Computing and Engineering in 2020. And here actually what we did was to reconsider the graph coloring problem because it was always considered using annealing devices. And if you had like N, uh, N nodes and K colors, like you have a graph, you have a graph and you want to color it with K colors in such a way that uh, no neighbors have the same colors. And um, we took different classes of Erdős-Rain uh, graphs and or actually Erdős-Rain graphs with different parameters to be more precise. And I checked this problem and both with annealing devices and with QAOA. But with QAOA, the huge advantage, what? And it was even not noticed in the QAOA literature before, is that actually, as I mentioned, we can also use higher order Hamiltonian, it's not only cube also ZI times ZJ, but also ZI, ZJ, ZK. And actually we could uh, reach an exponential improvement in the number of qubits. Like instead of K, number of colors, we would have only log K, so N times log K instead of N times K number of qubits we could use. And actually even the performance was better for our QAOA Hamiltonian than we did with this uh, uh, with this uh, if the space efficient embedding than without the space efficient embedding. So this was a nice collaboration which showed all the all the strength of the quantum uh, approximate optimization algorithm QAOA. So thank you very much for the invitation to this great uh, school. I don't know if you have questions or anything like that. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, your time and efforts. Um, actually, we, we have uh, two questions uh, in the chat. Just a second, let me uh, let me read them. So uh, the first one is, uh, so uh, are we ba basically trying to find the lowest energy state from the given states using the Hamiltonian? That is the first part. The second one is, uh, what decides that the system is fast or slow so it can retain its mm -hmm. ground state and not jump through the eigen spectrum? Perfect. Uh, so, so the first question. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what we have is that we have a, a cost Hamiltonian, and we want to estimate the energy, the lowest energy of that cost Hamiltonian. Uh, basically, that, that's the problem always. So how, or if we have some optimization problem, graph coloring, or or traveling salesperson problem. What we do is that we, in an easy way, there is an easy recipe, maybe not so easy, but relatively easy to write up the cost Hamiltonian, like quantum Hamiltonian or a classical, you can do both. And, uh, and the solution of the problem, for example, uh, which nodes should have which colors or, or which cities should be visited at which time, 
will be actually encoded in the ground state of the problem. Of course, to find the ground state is a hard problem, usually. I mean, you have a, you have a huge space, you cannot just uh, do linear algebra. So instead what we do, I, I took two approaches here. One approach was the either do a very slow time evolution from a known Hamiltonian, which has an easily preparable ground state, to this Hamiltonian, and we can, we can hope because of the adiabatic theorem, and I'm going to uh, talk about the second. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, what we have to know, we, we know that if this time evolution is uh, slow enough and the gap is uh, big enough, then we actually end up in this uh, in this uh, ground state, and then we have we, we can read off the ground state values and the energy, and then. Uh, we will know what the solution to the problem is. So first of all, I don't know if this answered the, the first question, but let me answer the second question, because the second question was perhaps about the adiabatic evolution, if I understood correctly. Uh, what determines whether we reach it or not? As you maybe remember, I had this formula. Actually, I'm going to show that formula to you, maybe uh, a second. It can always uh, be can always be reached, but maybe with exponentially uh, long time. Um, of course, if we don't have any errors and we are in uh, the quantum regime, sorry, I'm just this works very slowly, this one. Exactly this one. I'm just going to show this uh, here. Here, so this is a rigorous theorem, and you can see what it depends on. So it depends. Delta means the like you have this Hamiltonian path, so you have uh, a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And for each Hamiltonian, you calculate uh, the gap. So the difference between the lowest lying eigen, eigenvalue and the next eigenvalue. And then for each of these in the path you calculate, and then you take the low, smallest one of the, that, and that you call delta. And then you have also similarly the deriv derivatives of this evolution of the Hamiltonian in the norm. And you take the largest of that in the time. And then you can see if you plug in, you get here a number. And this number basically determines uh, for a given problem class. Of course, you always have a problem class, like an independent problem class. So coloring of graphs for with, with n side. So, but that number will determine whether you can go uh, exponentially fast uh, whether you can, you need exponentially many times or polynomial time for that. Basically, at least, at least if we, if this gives you a polynomial time uh, algorithm, then you can do it in polynomial time. If this gives, it's an upper bound only uh, exponential. You can still hope that that it, it, uh, it works or not. And unfortunately, there is actually a lot of physics involved. Not that's fortunate, but unfortunately, in physics there is something called the many-body localization and Anderson localization. And that says also that if you have a problem which is pretty random, like a spin blast problem or a, like a random problem, then this gap uh, will be very small, usually, unfortunately. So that's my answer. And one more thing to this. QAOA, on the other hand, tries to avoid this spectrum uh, Crossings, or or actually, it says that maybe you can cross the spectrum, but still reach the good ground state by this optimization procedure. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that uh, Professor Ahmed Yunus would like to say something or, or ask you something. Uh, thank you, Zoltan, for the talk, for the very interesting talk. Um, actually, I have one uh, question in in two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the first one is that uh, uh, um, quantum uh, annealing and adiabatic computing is continuous by nature. 
uh, yes. in terms of time. So when did you, uh, when you mentioned simulation, uh, uh, you, you used um, IBM quantum circuits, uh, which is discrete. Very uh, good. What, what, so, is the, so, what is the trick to transform from continuous to discrete? Okay, so I, I tell two two things here. First of all, when I talked about our quantum simulate, so real on the devices, we also simulated on uh, on D wave machine. In, for example, in the paper, uh, uh, so so we also did that. We also did this comparison between those two uh, things like the gate gate model. And how I, I transform the, the, to, to the gates is through this trotterization, basically. Or it's not trotterization, uh, it's this QA wave, which is, which is um, sort of inspired by trotterization, but it's a different method. It's, it's that you have to ch change it. But we did both. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that IBM machines are still a little bit noisy, so we, we couldn't get so good. Uh, Results. I can tell you a little bit about this. Actually, just today we had also a discussion about this, uh, uh, like with these people who we are working with, Karin and these Ericsson people. They have contact with ion trap uh, persons, and yeah. and they are less noisy ion traps. And we want to do QAOA simulation, no, like why, real on ion. Why not D wave? Because D wave is by nature uh, based on adiabatic uh, using adiabatic computing and quantum annealing. So, in my opinion, maybe D-Wave will be more suitable to this kind of, of quantum opportunity. We, we also do that. We also do that. So, so we are not uh, leaving that behind us. We are also doing that, both of them. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much for the questions. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, the, for the very interesting talk. Maybe someone else has. Okay, uh, I think that you, you you have answered this question, but uh, let me say it. Um, how to implement a diabetic model in in, circuit, in in the circuit model? I mean, or the the gate based model. So that's I, the I, same. I, like what, uh, yeah. So you have you to this. Uh, someone asked about uh, like published papers about this. You, you, I think that you have also covered this, and uh, uh, we have. I, I, I can send some published uh, papers about this. Like there are many. Them, okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that um, uh, I think that's it. Uh, Thank you very much. And finally, also, do you have any questions uh, that would like to ask, or I would like to to write them down? Um, I think that Professor Ahmed uh, would like to say something more. Ah. No, no, I didn't. I didn't know. Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> oh, but let me <laughs> tell you one more thing. I so I'm, I this. think it's sorry. very. Uh, what you have in Alexandria, it's a very, very nice uh, setup, and I'm very uh, impressed by this. I also looked at the web page, so I, I hope we can have a very good collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. One more thing before we finish this meeting, I have to mention that Zoltan and his group uh, are uh, one of the partners in the Center of Excellence in Alexandria University, and without this uh, uh, partnership, uh, it will not. It was not be possible to to organize this event. So you are uh, uh, in in the organizing uh, in, in of this event. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and and thanks a lot, uh, Professor Zoltan, for for your time, your effort, and presentation. Uh, right now, I will uh, I will stop the recording.